The controversial and restrictive Texas abortion law that went into effect last month is now on hold, for now. Late yesterday afternoon, a federal judge in Texas issued a temporary order blocking the enforcement of the state's six-week abortion ban. BNC's Derek Lewis has the latest. This is a horrible situation. It's basically uh, an assault on women. And uh, who's responsible for it? Most of them are men. This Texas doctor is tired of the back and forth on the legality of abortions. It's like a, a roller coaster or, or being like a yo-yo. And this is what the situation is right now. So as providers, you know, it's like one day, yes, the next day, no. A federal judge suspended Texas's abortion law Wednesday, calling it unconstitutional. Governor Greg Abbott signed the law in May, allowing lawsuits against doctors and any private citizen who helped make the abortion happen after a woman is six weeks pregnant. People who violate the law could be sued upwards of $10,000. This is not just a women's issue. Men are just as much part of this. And let me tell you, young man, if men are responsible for going through full-term pregnancies of nine months, we would not have another generation. Dean Nelson, a pro-life advocate, believes what a woman does with her body should be left solely up to her until she's pregnant. Instead, politicians should decide. The reality is, is that these are duly elected people. Uh, these people have a responsibility and a charge to protect individuals. He believes in protecting the unborn baby. When it comes in contact with another body that is living, growing, has a heartbeat on the inside of her, we believe that those bodies, those women, those little boys, uh, they deserve to be protected as well. If this Texas abortion law goes back into effect, medical providers are afraid of the impact it will have over time. We're going to go back to the same way. Women will find somewhere, somehow, to do this, you know, to themselves, to help and what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a lot more deaths. Women are gonna die because of that. In Houston, I'm Derek Lewis for Making the Case. The block could be just a temporary victim or victory for abortion rights advocates, but in his ruling, Judge Pittman says, quote, from the moment SB 8 went into effect, women have been unlawfully prevented from exercising control over their lives in ways that are protected by the Constitution. Here to discuss what this ruling could mean for both health providers and the women they serve is Marsha Jones, the co-founder and executive director at the AFIA Center, a reproductive justice organization in North Texas. Marsha, welcome back. Hello, it's nice to be back. Okay, so this opinion by Judge Pittman is 113 pages long, and it explains how this law is, quote, an aggressive scheme to deprive its citizens of a significant and well-established constitutional right. Your reaction, please, to this temporary injunction. So, of course, I am, I'm not gonna say I'm excited, but I'm happy to see somebody um, act in a way that we should be acting, right? Because we didn't get that from the Supreme Court uh, where we mm -hmm. expected to get it. And so, yes, I am, but Texas immediately filed an appeal, right? And so it goes before the Fifth Circuit. And so that's where I guess I, I my feelings of, whoo, and it begins again. It, here, 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 come, mm -hmm. here it all come, you know, this ping pong game, back and forth, back and forth, and women lives will be held in the balance. Um, but he was spot on uh, in what he said and what, what, what was done. Um, but the problem is it the fight begins all over again. Well, Marcia, and in the meantime, there's a uh, provision. Oh, yes, go ahead. No, go ahead. There's a provision in the law, as you know, that says if a ruling is made by a higher court that blocks the law, um, clinics could still be liable. Um, I remember you telling me about mm -hmm. the, um, the additional help that you had to get when this ban was first introduced, that the phone lines were ringing off the hook with questions and concerns. What has the response been like since this injunction was put into place yesterday? So, of course, um, you know, it's quick. So this just happened last night. Some people, you know, it just happened late. A lot of people didn't get the news and we didn't get up and really get started on it until today. But um, it 
started back, it is almost like the same kind of phone calls that we were getting in the beginning. Oh, so we can get abortions again. We can get abortions again. We can get abortions again. Yes. And so people are, we are in the process of, of course, trying to get people in. Um, but it don't matter how much our call, our phones ring, if the abortion clinics are not going to be able to serve them. Um, if the abortion clinics are not sure where they're going to sit in this um, once the fifth court, the fifth circuit court make their decision and if it goes against us then um the the suing the things that people do can be retro so anything that happened inside of the injunction if that's lifted then folk can still be sued so it's just like this really interesting place where people are so yes people are calling so yes we're getting them appointments because there's still barriers the, the four or six weeks or whatever that's not the only barrier People still have to get like while we're waiting for to see if the injunction, if we're gonna, if this is, if we're gonna be saved here for a moment, people are, people still have to get a sonogram. So even the people who called today, if they had not already had an appointment, they still have to get a sonogram. So there's still a 24 hour wait. What ha what if something happens inside of that 24 hour? So yes, we are rushing to see if we can get folk in to get service as soon as we possibly can in the safest way possible because we still have to keep people's safety at the front of everything that we do, but still not knowing what happens tomorrow. Well, that and it's just a my very next question. I time. Right. It's unsure. People are. Yeah, exactly. They're, we're kind of in limbo here. But that brings me to my next question. I know your organization partners with abortion uh, centers. Have you had the opportunity to speak to any of any of them? And, and what has been sort of the consensus on how um, they're going to proceed? Are some of them going to resume providing abortion services while they still can? So the so the people are, you know, they're putting people on a waiting list. That's some of the things that we've heard. You know, when people call, they're putting them on the waiting list, so at least they're there. We know, you know, that we can immediately get back to people. Um, people are going to do whatever they can do within this time as they wait. So the people that we are talking to, they're planning to move. They're to move as swiftly as they possibly can. See, here's the thing. I think this is the misunderstanding that people get when these abortion clinics are closed or when the services have to stop for a certain amount of time, it is not easy to just jump back up in the morning and start serving. You know, people mm -hmm. have to get back to work. Things have to be put in place. Appointments have to be made. Phone calls have to be made. Monies have to be promised. People have to get there. The sonogram have to happen. The person have the same doctor that do the sonogram have to perform even just to give the, the medicine, the pill or whatever. So there's a lot of things that have to happen. And so this is a very short time to even ask, to even think that abortion clinics will be up and moving this quick. But are they moving to serve the people as quickly as they possibly can, not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow? Yes, they are. The ones we are talking to are committed to doing all that they can do for as long as they can do it. I know that some there's a uh, clinics <laughs> providers, uh, absolutely, I know that some providers are not wanting to resume service because um, they don't want to give women false hope, right? That they start this process and then mm -hmm. something does happen that is final in court um, and they have to go back and say, well, ma'am, you can't get this abortion that you so desperately need. Um, is that a valid concern? That's a valid concern. And, and we've been here before. Um, this happened just last summer uh, in the height of COVID when the state of Texas had, our governor had deemed that abortion clinics were not deemed uh, essential care. And so he uh, mandated that the abortion clinics be closed. And we had people who were waiting to get an appointment and the, and the clinics were, you know, were closed. They were not deemed as essential. And so uh, the lawyers took to court, there was an injunction. And so we rushed, you know, to get people in court. I mean, I'm sorry, to get people serviced. And just like that, the appeal was granted to the state of Texas. And then just as quickly as we got them in, we could not get them. They still couldn't get the services, had an appointment, just waiting to go. And then of course, the, it was overturned, so that's a very uncertain. So I, 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 I get it. That is that is a righteous concern that the abortion. We just we've just experienced this just a year ago. 
of what happens in, the, in, in that really unstableness, you know, and some of the people we didn't get back. Well, Marsha, last question to you, because I'm running out of time now. But the state of Texas, we, you already mentioned, already made it clear that they plan to appeal the order to the fifth U.S. Court of Appeals, which is known to be the most conservative appeals court in the country. They had previously rejected a request from clinics to have the law blocked, just like the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, does that cause concern for you? Yes, it caused concern. Um, because our concern is the same. Uh, many of the women we serve already later in gestation than the average woman. And so um, trying to get that particular group of women in early, um, you know, we're struggling with that. And so that just means that this many more women we are just like literally not going to be able to serve. And I think for me, I think about it, we've been having a pretty righteous conversation with people who've been calling us. And I think we've been really successful and many people around us have been successful in, get, in being able to serve people really early. I know we've been having phone calls where we've been able to actually serve people and not turn them away. Um, but will they trust us? You know, like, are people gonna wanna just like go back and forth, back and forth? You know, there's a lot of things that we have to consider. But yeah, this is gonna cause us quite um, a lot of harm, but I want to say this, and I, I want to end it with this: um, the community have really showed up. People have really showed up. People are sending us pregnancy tests because I had, I had expressed that for many of the women that we serve, just running to the store to buy a pregnancy test may not be an option for them, so they still wouldn't be able mm -hmm. to know so soon that they're pregnant. So people have been giving us, they have been giving us pregnancy tests. People have been giving us uh, condoms. I mean, people have just, just been such an out pouring of things uh, that we have been receiving. We've had midwives to let us know that they will get us sonograms so that we can kind of expedite that time, uh, that small window. So the people are really rallying, rallying around this issue and they are not pleased with what's happening in Texas. Co-founder and executive director at the Afias Center, Marsha Jones, thank you so much for your time tonight.